Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 177, recorded November 24th, 2014. Super Intelligence. Triangulation is brought to you by FreshBooks, the number one cloud accounting solution that helps millions of entrepreneurs and small business owners save time billing and get paid faster. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash triangulation and join over 5 million users running their business hassle-free. And by SmartThings. SmartThings lets you control and monitor your home from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. To get started, visit smartthings.com slash twit and you'll save 10% off any home security or solution kit when you use the code TWIT10 at checkout. And by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have your whole financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash triangulation. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the smartest, most interesting people in technology and talk about stuff and it's always interesting you may remember uh, a few months ago we interviewed a fellow James Barrett who was a journalist not a not a scientist but he had written a book about artificial intelligence uh, and the end he called it of the human era our final invention in which he warned that uh, if the machines get smarter than us it could be all over for us our uh, guest today is Nick Bostrom he's the author of super intelligence Paths, Dangers, and Strategies. Uh, Nick is uh, joining us from his office in England where he's a professor on the Faculty of Philosophy um, uh, and uh, at the University of Oxford and uh, is director of the program on the impacts of future technology. Nick, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, what is superintelligence? I define it as any intellect that radically outperforms humanity in all practically relevant fields, including scientific creativity, social skills, general wisdom. Um, so um, this definition leaves open the question of how it would be instantiated, whether it would be a machine intelligence or some other right. kind of entity. And I'm, I'm sure you're familiar uh, with Mr. Barrett's book. Um, do you agree that the threat that artificial intelligence play, uh, play, pays to uh, humans is something for concern? Well, I think from a longer, um, in, in a longer time frame, the transition to the machine intelligence era <clears throat> will be of momentous significance and will be associated with a, a quite significant existential risks. Yeah. Existential risk being one where... <laughs> Um, the entire future is on the line, ways in which we could either go extinct or sort of permanently lock ourselves into some radical, radically suboptimal state. You don't mean existential uh, in the sense of it's a, if it's a, an emotional or philosophic <laughs> crisis. You mean no, not, a, a not danger like to our existence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> so as, as well as an enormous upside if we do manage to, to get this transition right. Yeah. So hence um, the reason for writing this book is that it seems to be this kind of pivot point <clears throat> on which um, the future might depend and, and therefore a suitable point to focus our efforts to try to uh, get clear understanding. It's really interesting because um, uh, for a long time, uh, I I'm old enough to remember when artificial intelligence was the next big thing and then it wasn't. Uh, it looked like it was, a f it was a failed concept. But now all of a sudden, in the last few years, Lots of people are, uh, you know, kind of going along with Ray Kurzweil in the thinking that we are approaching what Ray calls a singularity, where machines will become indistinguishable. Machine intelligence will become indistinguishable from human intelligence. And then, and then there's the next step, people like James Barrett, Elon Musk, for instance, who says uh, we need to be super careful with artificial intelligence. It could be more dangerous than nukes. We're starting to worry about artificial intelligence. What happened? It wasn't, isn't artificial intelligence a great failure? Uh, yeah, like a failure twice over. So there have been 
in the history of AI. It's not that long a history because it's really only since we had computers for the past six years or so that people have been working on this. But um, one can distinguish two great AI winters. These were periods where uh, a previous hype bubble had burst and, and people became disillusioned. And, and the very term AI was something that you didn't want to sort of uh, right. use to brand your, your efforts. But, but now we're kind of in a, in a third wave of enthusiasm at the moment. It's a very open question whether this will be the wave that gets us all the way to uh, human level or super human levels of a AI, uh, or, or more likely whether there might be a few more cycles um, of excitement followed by disillusionment before we finally get there. So I'm fairly agnostic as to the time frames involved. I think the truth is just that uh, nobody knows how long this will take. So we should think in terms of a fairly um, smeared out probability distribution over a wide range of possible arrival dates. Yeah, of course, uh, Ray thinks it's going to be in the next few <laughs> decades. Um, anybody who's spent any time trying to talk to a computer <laughs> might, might think it's going to take longer. Um, you, you wrote an interesting article uh, uh, for the uh, Journal of Consciousness Studies uh, titled, How Hard is Artificial Intelligence? And, and uh, you note that um, it, the people say, well, look, we, intelligence evolved on Earth. How hard could it be to kind of replicate that process and make machines intelligent in the same way? But it, it turns out it's harder than one might think. Yeah, so depending on what one thinks, um, <laughs> I guess it so. might be harder or easier than that. <laughs> uh, okay, it's, it's, but, not, it's not trivial. That, that, yeah, sure. So it, it's harder than, than we have managed to do so far. Right. We're not very um, good at so it. So that yet. particular paper investigates. So, so one possible approach one might think um, would be guaranteed to deliver AI uh, is if one tried to somehow replicate the evolutionary processes that right. already have produced general intelligence once in biology. So you can make some rough estimates of the um, kind of computational power of this evolutionary process that led to human intelligence. And, and maybe one could then try to run some kind of argument that if we had computers that could produce a similar amount of computation, then it would be likely that evolutionary algorithms would produce artificial intelligence. Right. Or maybe they could do it with much less computing power, given that you could streamline the evolution to specifically shoot for uh, intelligence. But uh, that argument has various complications, uh, including the, the fact that we don't really know how easy it was for biology to produce human intelligence. I mean, it happened on this planet, but we don't know how many other planets uh, it failed to happen on. So, so, so that kind of inference is not as straightforward as one might think. This stuff is so fun to think about, but also so challenging. Uh, for instance, of course, we think we're intelligent. So if we're using ourselves as the benchmark of intelligence, it, it's almost uh, circular logic to say, well, evolution got us to here. There's also the issue, and Jeff Hawkins, who's been on this show as well, uh, has talked about that, of the fact that, that computers are essentially von Neumann devices and very linear and deterministic, whereas the human brain is architecture itself is very different. And, and Jeff argues that we need to figure out how to duplicate the architecture of the human brain first, that you may never get from point A to point B if you use a von Neumann device. How, what, what? Well, a von Neumann machine is very flexible. It can be used to emulate uh, other computational structures. So we know the brain is a giant neural network, but we can run neural networks on any old desktop or, or laptop that you have around. Um, it's just that we do it in software rather than having the, the, the hardware basis itself, having that structure. So it's a general purpose machine that could even duplicate the, the, yeah. the, the human yeah, brain's right. processes, the massively parallel process of the human brain. And I think that's, yeah. ex that's in some ways what Jeff's trying to do uh, by creating um, massively parallel uh, memory chips at Numenta. So how, how has the progress been in all of this? Are we making progress in just kind of generating, using evolutionary processes, uh, human-like intelligence? Oh, well, so I wouldn't want to give the misleading impression that I think that evolutionary processes is, is what is going to deliver the goodies. This particular paper just looks at one argument that tries to set a kind of uh, upper bound on how difficult it would be and says that there are problems with that upper bound. 
Um, but it might very well be that there are more direct avenues than trying to uh, sort of imitate the way that evolution produced intelligence. Yeah, and one of the um, natures of this kind of AI research is people are trying all sorts of avenues. That's right, yeah. And uh, each has uh, his or her own conviction about yep. which is most promising to succeed. But if one takes a step back and look at the field as a whole, um, it's, of course, um, difficult to know which of these horses will like be first over the finishing line or more likely a, a horse that hasn't yet been born as it were, like maybe some new kinds of approach that will be developed a few decades from now. But so you're being pretty cautious in any predictions you're making as to time frame and even as to which methodology is going to work. But is it kind of the general consensus that we will solve this, that we will create a machine that is intelligent in human terms? I certainly think we will. I mean, assuming science and technology continues apace, then um, we have already a generally intelligent system. It's this finite physical system that if nothing else works, we could figure out how it is that the human brain produces intelligence and then kind of reverse engineer that. That should get us there eventually. Although it might well be that more purely synthetic approaches will, will get there first. I think that some of the people who are commonly believed to be denying the possibility of creating human-level machine intelligence, if one reads them more closely, some of the time, all they're really saying is that uh, it's very far off and we have no idea how to do it. But that claim is quite different from the claim right. that we will never do it. And it's not even a claim you might disagree with. We are far off. And we <laughs> well, I think we don't <laughs> know. I, don't, I, don't, I think we don't really know how right. far off we are. Right. Is it possible? I mean, we've seen this so often in technology that uh, at some point there's this massive shift, this big discovery, and all of a sudden it happens. Yeah, so that's possible. Um, we did a survey uh, of uh, uh, some of the world's leading AI experts last year, asked them, among other questions, the question, by what year do you think there is a 50% probability that we will have achieved human-level machine intelligence? The median answer to that uh, was 2040 or 2050, depending on wow. precisely which group of experts we asked. But I mean, there should be a huge uncertainty on, on either side of that estimate. Um, so, so the book, I mean, I did do talk a little bit in, in the first two chapters about the history of AI and, and how we might get to um, human level AI. But the bulk of the book is really about what happens uh, at that point. Yeah. If we get human level AI, what happens next? Nah, that, and that, so. that is the interesting thing to think about. We're going to we're going to get into that. We're talking with uh, Nick Bostrom, the author of Super Intelligence: Paths, Dangers, and Strategies. We'll get to dangers uh, next. A really interesting uh, book some have called uh, The Silent Spring for the uh, Artificial Intelligence Era. You remember Rachel Carson in the early 60s? proclaimed that uh, the uh, earth that we are killing the earth and we better do something about it quick uh and uh i think maybe nick has some warnings for uh, us for artificial intelligence we'll we'll address those in just a second our guest nick bostrom will be back but first a word from our uh, sponsors fresh books the number one cloud accounting solution cloud means this is so great you don't download software you don't have to put it on your computer you can do it through a web uh page and even better, you can get your financial uh, uh, business in order through their apps as well. I have to say, this is the way it started for me with invoicing. And you see right there on the front page, online invoicing made easy. But once you start using FreshBooks, you realize it's so much more than that. The new year is approaching. This would be a great time to kind of get a handle on your clients, your invoices, to track your time and expenses to kind of get your small business in order. If you're a freelancer, a small business, FreshBooks is a lifesaver. It was for me when I first discovered it almost 10 years ago. Uh, and with their new award-winning mobile apps, you can do it from anywhere, Android or iOS. You can create invoices online that look great. They look like your company. Snap photos, receipts on your phone. Get them in the database. Get real-time business reports in just a couple of clicks of the mouse. It is a really great solution. Plus you will get paid faster. And they've actually done research. The average FreshBooks customer doubles their revenue in the first 24 months. They almost immediately increase their billing because people, I don't know what it is. It certainly was my case. Well, part of it is because when you're doing this all by yourself and you're doing it in Microsoft Word or something like that, those invoices don't get done in a timely fashion. And people tend to ignore them. 
With FreshBooks, it's so easy. You create the invoices. You can have them sent automatically if you wish. The invoice can come via email, or they will lick a stamp and put it in an envelope for you and send it that way. In fact, I, with some of my clients, would do both because you never know. FreshBooks will make sure that you get paid and make it easy for the client to pay you right there in the email, which that makes a huge difference. Uh, you'll get paid faster. And because the automated late payment reminders happen automatically, you don't have to make those awkward phone calls or those emails where you're like, you know, you haven't paid me in a while. Could you? That's really a pain. FreshBooks easily can accept credit cards and other online payments. So your clients really, they want to pay you. You just have to make it easy for them. Integrates easily and well with Google Apps, PayPal, Stripe, MailChimp, Fundbox, Zen Payroll. You can scale quickly, add clients, projects, and staff as a snap. And they are they have been voted the number one customer support team in the world with the FreshBooks Support Rockstars. Help is free forever. You will speak to a real-life human every time. Emma Cossey, who is the uh, consultant and uh, editor of The Freelance Lifestyle, says she loves using FreshBooks for expenses. She said, I took a snap of my train ticket, entered the details, job done. You'll love it, and that's why I want you to try it free for 30 days. FreshBooks.com slash triangulation. When they ask you, how did you hear about it? Would you do me a favor and mention triangulation? Thank you. Start your 30-day free trial today at freshbooks.com slash triangulation. I think you'll see how much easier it is. In those 30 days, you'll probably, uh, you'll probably get paid faster and better. I used it for years. I love it. Freshbooks.com slash triangulation. Our guest, Nick Bostrom, is the author of a uh, new book called Super Intelligence. And uh, it is, as he mentioned in the beginning, an, an introduction to uh, AI and the various paths and the history, the rocky, bumpy history of AI. Uh, but assuming that it's going to happen, that a machine... It, it, and and you, would you characterize this as Ray Kurzweil does, that the, the singularity will be when a machine is indistinguishable from a human? And, and, I, and that's more than the Turing test. That's, that's really a machine seems to be thinking and conversing how, like HAL 9000. That, is that what we're talking about? Not necessarily. There might not be a stage where the machines are similar or equivalent to human. They might first be inferior in some ways and superior in some ways and then superior in all ways uh, without reaching any kind of um, stage of exact comparability. I guess you could uh, say we, in some ways we've reached that point. I mean, there are certainly things that uh, the, computers, the first point, yeah. yeah I mean, the computers do better than I could ever do. Yeah, so for like um, calculation, memorization, um, mm -hmm. some some forms of pattern recognition, um, quickly and then, executing. And, and then in other ways, tasks. they're not as intelligent as a three-year-old human. Yeah. Particularly so, in speech uh, and face and handwriting recognition. All the things that we take for granted, those are actually hard problems. Yeah, so some of these, uh, there have been big progress writing, um, recognizing hand written characters and such is done. So the, the post office is like have kind of automated mm -hmm. um, uh, hand uh, written character recognition software that helps sort the mail and such. So in some of those areas, there have been some progress, quite large progress yeah. um, in, 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 in continuing progress over, just over the last couple of years with uh, deep learning networks and such. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, so the like the kind of the um, the view about what are the really difficult parts have, have shifted over time. Uh, when, when people first started out playing with computers, it was common to believe that something like playing chess, this was the epitome of human intellection. So like if you could, if you could get a, a computer to play chess, then, then you would have succeeded with AI. Then it turned out that uh, it wasn't so hard to do that and computers beat humans in chess. So then there were other things that were seen as the difficult thing, like like recognizing patterns and navigating the physical terrain. But there, there, there is big progress now. Um, but, but there are still other areas where the computers still do very poorly. Common sense, uh, the ability to form and combine complex co concepts in, in, in flexible ways and so forth. Right. I remember, I, I played chess and I remember very well uh, what my first chess playing machines I could beat. It didn't take long before they could beat me every time. And now... Uh, chess, chess playing machines are uh, as among the top players in the world. I know there's still a question of whether human, human intelligence oh, no, no, can the, be the, 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 the chess computers are far superior to the, yeah. the human grandmasters at this stage. Yeah, I think they acknowledge that in themselves. Um, and so that actually prompted an existential crisis in the chess world. Some people thought, why play chess if a machine can play it better 
Always. And we found a way around that. We still play chess. Just we try not to play. Machines. Yeah, so the, the human chess world <laughs> is still flourishing. Still flourishing, thank goodness. Um, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, what we... Uh, I wonder if this is a changing... It's kind of in a way a changing goal because... Oh, yeah, we solved that. It turned out it was all calculation. Um, still pretty impressive when you see a, a machine play chess well. Uh, um, yeah, sure. Um, it moved the uh, goal uh, line. <laughs> it, it, uh, it, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the real uh, critical capability is that of the engineering capability, the ability to do computer science right. and AI research. So once, once machines surpass us in that, then they it's, can quickly use that special capability to obtain all the other capabilities yeah. that they might not yet have at that stage. So that would that be the measure? Uh, I mean, tell me what the what the. It's not it's not playing chess better than a human. So what is it that we, we then we would say ah aha it has happened. So what what would be what the, would be uh, the event that would that say maybe there isn't a single event where we would say ah machines have now achieved human level intelligence. Well, so if there will be a, a, a time when they have human level intelligence, which depends, I think, on the pathways. Right. That 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 takes us there. So, like in some scenarios, you would have something that didn't stop at the human level or even pass it. It would take kind of a different uh, trajectory through the right. configuration. So, to arrive at something that was unambiguously superior to us in all ways, in all in all respects, but but without going through some intermediate stage where it was like a kind of a human-like thing in a box. Right. In fact, that seems like that's more likely, frankly. Probably, yeah. somewhat more likely. Yeah. Um, so what do we do? What uh, is the th first? What is the threat of such a thing? Well, so a super intelligence could be an extremely powerful thing for, for the same reason, ultimately, that that we humans are very powerful relative to other animals, because we have slightly cleverer brains that enable us to develop an advanced uh, technological infrastructure and complex social organization and plans. That's why now the fate of the gorillas depend a lot more on what we humans do than on what the gorillas themselves do. Uh -huh. Similarly, if there were uh, uh, brains that were radically superior to human brains in general intelligence, then they also would be able to very quickly develop all kinds of futuristic technologies that maybe the human species would have developed over thousands of years and make very effective plans and so forth so as to be able to find ways to shape the future according to their preferences. So, so the, the danger then is that their preferences might not coincide <laughs> with ours. Um, and it looks quite difficult um, to engineer a motivation system or a preference function that would embody human values. Um, yeah, that's the issue. I once asked Ray Kurzweil... Um because Ray is, is very sanguine about uh, the singularities. Oh, it'll be great. <laughs> I, said, I, I pointed this out, actually. Ray, there's no guarantee these machines will share our, our, our ethics, our morals, or anything, or our goals for the, the planet. And he says, oh, no, they'll think of us as their parents. They'll protect us as we would our parents. But if, I, if you were a gorilla, you might not be so uh, sanguine about <laughs> your future among humans. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, so if we think of how we unfortunately treat a lot of non-human yeah, animals, yeah, um, we, who are all our parents in some sense, they are our ancestors, uh, like all the way back to primordial goo. Is this something we should be considering now? We should be uh, building into any uh, attempt to make a superintelligence some form of protection for ourselves? Well, so the big, uh, I call it the control problem, which is the problem of how would you engineer the initial conditions for an intelligence explosion? How would you engineer a seed AI such that when it eventually becomes a super intelligence, the outcome will be safe and beneficial mm -hmm. for humans? So this is a big unsolved technical problem at this stage. It ain't Asimov's, a, it ain't Asimov's laws of robotics. No, so, so, so one kind of progress that has occurred over the last years is that we have obtained a much deeper appreciation for just how difficult this control problem is. Mm -hmm. There are a number of sort of superficially plausible ideas for how to solve it that turn out not to work. Uh, and so it's negative progress, but it's still progress. Like we know now that there are a number of dead ends yeah. and, and that the real problem is much deeper and harder than one might initially have supposed. So what is needed now, and this is one of the reasons for writing this book, is to try to get some of the best mathematical 
uh, minds of, of our generation and the next to actually work on these technical problems. Um, the solutions to which we need before somebody figures out a solution to how to make machines intelligent. Then yeah. there's this race on between, on the one hand, all the people trying to figure out how to create uh, artificial intelligence and then a, a very much smaller set of people who are trying to figure out how you would ensure that that would be safe. You and say it, math it's critical that the second part like kind of is, is solved before the first. Yeah. You say mathematical minds. Well, primarily, yeah. So there's like work in theoretical computer science, mathematics, some parts of philosophy. Um, kind of a mathematical line like maybe, mine like maybe Bertrand Russell was a mathematical mind. Sure, yeah, there are a lot of mathematical minds, uh, yeah. and but uh, but he was uh, also a great philosopher, and that's right. He yeah. would probably have been a useful person to have on the team. <laughs> I wish he'd been um, thinking about that. But 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 the kids to kind of move this over from the uh, domain of science fiction and Hollywood movies and right. into the domain where technical work is being done, like actually focused research work is being done to solve these problems. You can't. You could make the case that the that these all this science. I mean, this is a very very common theme in science fiction, that the human race has kind of been a little nervous about this for some time. Going back to R U R at the turn of the last century, that they've been always a little bit worried about these mechanical minds and what they might, how they might treat us. Um, has that been helpful or harmful to this process of actually trying to solve the problem? Well, a little bit. I need. I mean, on the one hand, so science fiction and stuff can kind of, I don't know, like expand people's mental horizons and, and help them ponder things that they might not otherwise have pondered. But on balance, probably bad in as much as it crowds out right. actual research in these areas. It's If a topic becomes associated with science fiction, it might deter right. like academics from working on it. Well, that's one and goal of your book, very, isn't it? To yeah, to, it's exactly. Yeah. So there's a very different, so if, if you're um, um, a science fiction author, you want to develop a scenario, but the main criterion for whether it's a good scenario or not is whether it, it makes for an entertaining, interesting story. Uh, but the class of scenarios that are maximally entertaining might be quite disjoint from the class of scenarios that are maximally plausible. Mm -hmm. So if you have this extra criterion that you have to satisfy make all to be interesting and entertaining then then it's very unlikely that you will also succeed in being plausible it, it's hard enough to get these things right even if the only thing you're caring about is getting it right but if in addition you have to make uh, a room for for a, a plot line with with human characters that play key roles in the sequence of challenges then 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 chances are you're going to sacrifice a lot of possibility well, just using the phrase HAL 9000, I mean, I think a lot of people, when they think superintelligence, they go, oh, you mean like HAL? And as you've pointed out, it, it could very well not look like that at all. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, In at, fact, at, at, if at, we prepare for a HAL 9000, we may, we may miss the boat entirely. Yeah, so in general... It looks like one has to go about some of these things in a fairly abstract way to actually do research on these things. You don't want to necessarily paint a rich, concrete, colorful picture of a particular right. human-like AI that you're then struggling with. Like That's almost certainly going to be wrong. But there are more abstract concepts that might be useful for describing classes of AIs and classes of AI behaviors. Right. And um, so, so that's why I was emphasizing mathematical talent before, yeah. because I think that that, that is, is, is something that will be needed in this field. Yet, I think uh, uh, multidisciplinary, as you are, I mean, this, this whole thing is really a multidisciplinary uh, thing. Your background's in physics, in computational neuroscience, in mathematical logic, and in philosophy. And I think that though all of these have, uh, have a, a point of view on this that, that needs to be uh, Yeah, considered. and, and my research, research institute here as well, we have mathematicians, philosophers, and scientists yeah. working in concert. We're very lucky to be talking to Nick Bostrom, who's one of the foremost thinkers in this area um, and uh, a recipient of the uh, Eugene R. Gannon Award, uh, which should tell you something, also included in the uh, Prospect Magazine's World's Thinker list, the youngest person in the top 15 from all fields and the highest ranked analytic philosopher. That's a good title. I like analytic philosopher. Uh, his latest is... Uh, He's got over 200 publications in some very interesting fields, which we might talk a little bit about, but his latest is called Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers, and Strategies just came out and is well, for anybody who watches any of our 
uh, shows, I think, uh, well worth reading, not only for the kind of the tour of the history of uh, artificial intelligence, but for a look at what some kind of a surprising look at what it might, what, what it might, machine intelligence might be like, and then the risks uh, inherent. We'll have more uh, with Nick in just a little bit. Our show today brought to you by the beginnings of machine intelligence in your home. But not in a scary way. I'm talking about smart things. Smart Things was a Kickstarter project that, that took off like crazy and is now uh, a wonderful series of products designed to make home automation simple. It all starts with the Smart Things Smart Hub. Smart, this talks to everything, which is so great. Uh, you, you know if you've tried to set up a smart home or home automation before that the, the, the kind of the tower of babble of different uh, protocols and, and, and ways of interlinking make it very difficult. This solves all of that. Because the SmartThings Hub talks to literally hundreds of the most popular connected devices. If you go to their page, you'll see everything from Schlage locks to uh, Logitech to Dropcam and Nest to the Sonos players. I, I love my Sonos music system. Well, I could tie that into the system. My Philips Hue lights. All and you know, and these are a variety of different protocols. And if you're a developer, you can also create new th new ways to use SmartThings and publish them for everyone to use. SmartThings starts and i think this is because it's easy for people to kind of understand with with the basic kits kind of the kinds of things you can do with smart things their home security kits uh are are really fabulous uh, but you also they now have these uh, uh, wonderful um uh, uh solution kits they call them that that are specific solutions within your home things like well how do i make sure that my pipes don't burst which is a combination, of course, of moisture sensing, but temperature and thermostats and all of that. These kits are fabulous. They all start with the hub, of course. Solution kits start uh, at just $170 once you apply our uh, our discount. Home security kits at $350. Each includes a hub plus a bunch of the little smart thing units that do hickeys. <laughs> like the smart sense motion, which can trigger things to turn on when there's movement and can send you an alert. If there's motion when you're not home, the presence is really interesting. This little device will tell you uh, when people or cars arrive or when people or cars or things leave. You could you could put this in your kid's backpack. You'd know where your kid if your kid comes home. Can help you find where you've left your keys. This is really a really neat. And then the multi sensor could do all sorts of things. It looks like a traditional you know kind of sensor you'd put on a window. There's two pieces so that you can tell when a window's open, but it also can tell you when valuable items move. It, it'll know the temperature in a room or area, so you can sense motion, you can sense temperature, you can sense moisture. Look at the kits, and you'll find something, a solution that you want, and it's just the beginning of uh, getting your home fully automated. Now, they recently announced that next year you're also going to be able to control and automate a variety of Samsung appliances, including refrigerators, washer, dryers, air conditioners, and even a robotic vacuum. Your home is going to be smarter than you are in a few years. <laughs> to get started creating your smart home, visit smartthings.com slash twit, and we'll give you 10% off any home security or solution kit when you use the offer code TWIT10 at checkout. TWIT10 at checkout. You'll turn your home into a smart home in as little as 15 minutes. Free shipping within the U.S. too when you go to smartthings.com slash twit. We thank Smart Things so much for their support of our show. We're talking about super smart things, super intelligence, with Nick Bostrom, who's one of the foremost thinkers in this area. Can you, I mean, I understand, we don't, and I, and I really appreciate it that you're not saying how soon it's going to happen or what it's going to look like. But what is it going to look like? <laughs> and when? And when? I don't care about when. I understand uh -huh. that's really hard. Anybody who's spent any time in technology knows that things happen both faster and slower than you imagine but never at the pace you expect. Um, so we, we could kind of live with it. It could be sometime 2040 or 2140. But what is it? And it probably will be somewhere in that range, I would guess. Perhaps, yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Even there, you're not Okay, so what is it going to look like? So yeah. it's like, I guess it's probably going to maybe look like, I don't know, but like, so one, one not impossible way would be that you'd first see some proliferation of... Um, um, infrastructure on, on the surface of our planet, as in computational hardware, uh, solar collecting um, panels and cooling towers, and then uh, space um, colonization uh, launching probes and rockets that fly out to initiate um, 
a, a colonization process where self-replicating probes land on different resources, initially in our solar system and then, then beyond. And then if you look at this on a very large time scale, you just see this bubble of civilization spreading right. through the accessible parts of the universe. And that then just continues. And is um, your goal for, that we're along for the ride? Well, or at, that, that human values help shape the long-term yeah. outcome here so that yeah. in this bubble of infrastructure, there is something worthwhile going on, uh, which might be sentient minds that have wonderful experiences or something like that. Um, so from, from, from an outside point of view, this might be a relatively boring process that just continues for a few billion years until the, the expansion of the universe makes it impossible to reach any further resources. Um, and that, that might be the long-term destiny of Earth-originating intelligent life. But, but everything then depends on what goes on inside this, this bubble of infrastructure, what all of these resources are used for. Right. And that might depend on how we set up the initial conditions for this intelligence explosion. In, in particular, how we engineer the motivation systems of, of the first superintelligence, um, because it might then have an incentive and a motive to, to carry that its initial values on into other uh, processes that it designs and creates. Richard Dawkins makes the case that really the motivation for uh, human, all human life and, and evolution was merely to replicate. Will the machines have the same goal? Well, I don't think that the humans generally have the goal to replicate as much as possible. We, well, to we preserve are, uh, our gene, let's say, to replicate no, our gene. No, I mean, so, no? so we are more like adaptation executioners rather than fitness maximizers. So ah. Evolution might have selected for organisms which in the environment in which they evolved, behaved in ways that maximized their inclusive fitness. However, that was done by creating, say, animals with various drives and motives that might not directly map onto fitness. Mm -hmm. So we humans now, in this unusual environment, the modern world, certainly do not behave in ways that maximize our fitness. So if, if you were a man and your only goal in life was to maximize your inclusive fitness, maybe you would spend your days like donating a sperm to a fertility clinic or something. Uh, but in fact, we have other goals um, that in the environment of evolutionary aptitudes would have been conducive to fitness, but say having um, sex with contraceptives like produces right. zero offspring, but right. we, we still have a drive for sex. We have a drive for status, for success, for health, for fun, for enjoyment, song, dance, art, all these things. Um, so I don't think it's correct that that, that we humans have a, a motivation um, that is uh, like consists of trying to maximize our inclusive fitness or, or having as many offspring as possible. Well, well, well and, then what, and will, a, what no will be the motivation of a superintelligence? What will its well? So this this seems be? like even more open and than than with so there's this vast space of possible goals that you could have. I think there is no necessary connection between how intelligent are and and what goals you have. You could have a highly intelligent entity that was very benign uh, or that was very evil or that had some, t what to us might seem like uh, uninteresting goal, like making as many paper clips as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Conceivable that you could have a super intelligent, his only goal in life is to make paper clips. And it would then be really good at making paper clips. <laughs> and it might ensure that the entire future light con uh, is filled with paper clips and paper clip factories. <laughs> And you could plug in whatever else you want instead of paper clips. But for most things you plug in, if you think through what it would mean to optimize for that value, um, you see that matter organized in a way that optimizes for this arbitrary value would typically not have any place for humans right. or human values. So a, a world where there are as many paper clips as possible is a world where there are no human bodies because we consist of atoms that could be used to make more paper clips. So it's actually quite challenging to define a goal that that would uh, preserve any part of what it is that we value. In many cases, and, the issue would be the competition for resources, wouldn't it? I mean, uh, yeah, so that's, like kind of, that's kind of where we, we lose out in a paperclip man world because we're a resource that's just getting in the way yeah, of the paperclips. Not, it's not because this AI would hate us. Right. Uh, it's just because, well, A, we might 
try to shut the AI off. So just from the view of avoiding that, it might be useful to get rid of us. But B, right. uh, we also... We're not paperclips. <laughs> use, we, yeah, exactly. We use resources. So, so um, um, is, it sens is it sensible or uh, to try to imbue... Uh, I mean, that uh, I, I think it's pretty clear that you can't ascribe evil or good to a machine. Um, is it sensible to try to add those human values to a machine intelligence? Well, it would make a lot of sense to try to make it good. Um, the problem is that, well, there are two problems. So one is the technical problem. Of, suppose you had decided what value you wanted to give an AI. Like to maximize, I don't know, let's just say justice or fairness or right. pleasure or like any sort of plausible human value like that. So we don't know today how to actually program in love in C++ or Python or justice. Like these are just human level concepts that we don't know how to define in computer code. So that's one big problem, this technical problem of um, like installing a value in an, in an AI. And, and the second problem is, even if we knew how to solve that technical problem, we would still have the value of which, the, the, the problem of selecting which value to give the AI. This is a more philosophical problem. Um, both of these have to be solved. Um, the best approach so far to especially to the value selection problem is, is what is known as indirect normativity, where instead of trying to specify in detail some desired end state, you try to specify some process whereby the AI itself uh, could learn and figure out what it is that we were trying to refer to when, when we were coming up with these descriptions that we want the AI to do something that is good, that protects human values, that serve our interests, etc. And, and then try to leverage the, the AI's intelligence to, to figure out, uh, to do the same kind of cognitive work that we would be doing if we were trying to, to create this kind of articulation. Somebody once told me, maybe it was Jeff Hawkins, he said, it's fine to have AI, just make sure it doesn't replicate. Is that, a, is that maybe one of the laws? I don't think it looks very fruitful to think in terms of laws here. Um, but why not? Why are laws but, a bad idea? Well, well, because um, it looks very difficult to capture in, in some reasonable set of laws all, all the features that we care about. Um, so Isaac Asimov was this science fiction author who famously tried to formulate the three laws of robotics, which then became four laws of robotics. <laughs> Uh, and a lot of his novels consist in exploring how things have unintended consequence, how these the robots that run on these laws right. behave in unintended ways. So, so one of the laws is like allow no human to come to harm, for example, right. which maybe sounds plausible at first encountering this as something we would want our AI to do. But when you think through what it would actually mean to allow no human to come to harm, for one, it would mean that you could never allow a human to be born because whenever somebody comes into existence, <laughs> there's a die. risk that they will come to harm. <laughs> yeah, and eventually, right. they all come. We all come to we harm. We all come to harm. Yeah. So, so now suddenly you have prevented any new human from being born. And if you start to think through these, <laughs> oh, God. Uh, it, it just seems kind of hopeless to, to think that we could on the first try create some complicated set of laws and rules that okay. would cover all the cases. So what do we do? So, Principles? What, what is it that we're going to look for here? So, well, so with this indirect normativity, so, so to make it more concrete, suppose you could give the AI the goal of doing that, which we would have asked it to do, if we had thought about this question for much longer, if we had pondered this for 40,000 years. <laughs> In so other words, say. and if we you, ourselves had... You design your own law. This, <laughs> well, sorry? You design your own law. You tell the AI, you design your own law. In effect. Yeah, but you have to specify <laughs> some criterion for what right. counts okay. as, as a solution to that. So the idea is to maybe try to... Um, I create a pointer towards an idealized version of ourselves, the, what we would have asked it to do if we had uh, had the opportunity to ponder this question for a long time, if we had been smarter, if we had known more facts ourselves. Um, so then you have transformed the question into an empirical question. What is it that we would in fact have asked it to do under the circumstances? And then, then you can um, use the AI's superior intelligence to make better estimates of what the answer is to that empirical question than, than maybe we could do if we just tried to have a direct stab at it ourselves. Seems, so in this way, sensible. we try to offload the maximum amount of cognitive work right. um, onto the AI. So um, what are these uh, first principles? And what is it that we want, we would, what is the idealized uh, uh, human uh, goal? Well, so we don't have to know that. This is the point of this. Well, we, we have to give it some starting point. 
Yeah, but the starting point would be to to do that, which we would have asked it to do under these <laughs> idealized circumstances. And just leave so it at could, that? <laughs> but what, yeah, but we're so, saying we, what, we're optimizing for something, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. But we, we don't know exactly what it is in this case. Wow. This is going to be a very smart machine. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what we're talking about, right? <laughs> I mean, so, it has to be able to do better than, uh, at this kind of problem than we are, right. or, or it not be super intelligent right. in the okay. first place. All right, interesting. So, uh, I'm, and now I'm stymied, because I don't even know what your instruction is going to be to the machine. Just figure it out. Do, it, do what we would have done if we'd been thinking about this for long enough and we're as smart as you. Yeah, so this is like one approach. Um, I think one of the more, maybe the more, certainly one of the most promising. So this is still is a, a major technical problem of how actually to implement something like this. And, and there are a number of details that would have to be worked out. But um, do you have to be able to encode it in C++? I mean, do you, do you have to be able to encode it in an algorithmic description? Well, ultimately what we are doing is programming a computer. So right. it has to so. come in. But, but obviously one would imagine uh, leveraging the AI's ability to learn. Um, so, so here the general approach falls into various like different ideas for how to go about it. But you could imagine having some uh, like subhuman AI that initially is brought up to a human level, acquiring human concepts, and then maybe once those conceptual representations are in place inside the AI, maybe you could then use those to define the goal that we wanted to have, and then it could allow the AI to continue to become super intelligent. Yeah, because one of that. the problems is it's not going to be a flip, uh, flip of the switch, oh, now it's intelligent, it's going to be a fairly gradual process. At what point do we start? I mean, we got to start planning now. And certainly, the machines that exist now—are we? Are, do we have to start with existing machines? Where, where do we start injecting this? Well, at the moment, I think there is absolutely no need because the machines we have now are not—they're uh, <laughs> like not posing that kind of dangers. Like. Right. The, Whatever concerns one might have about current machines are completely different. So, like right. concerns about privacy or drones or right. like stuff like that, unemployment. These are very different kinds of issues. Um, but um, because it looks like quite difficult to actually solve these technical problems that you would need to to fix the control problem, we need to get working on them now. But we don't have any super intelligences to test them on. So, so we have to work in a more abstract way, trying to figure out some of the underlying principles here, develop some concept, um, develop some ideas for techniques that could then be made more concrete as and when we actually are developing the particular architecture that we might think would be able to attain super intelligence in the future. How many people are working on this problem right now? Well, so it's a very small number. I mean, depending on how you count, maybe half a dozen or a dozen people in the world. Um, so it's compared to the number of people who are somehow contributing to doing developing machine intelligence. So that's tens of thousands, or I mean, right. if you count the hardware industry and neuroscience, maybe a million. Um, it, it's a very um, minuscule uh, amount of effort in terms of funding and manpower that, that the humanity is currently putting into solving the control problem. But the flip side of that, of course, is that if you are a philanthropist or if you are a talented young guy who wants to go into this field, you might make a very noticeable difference by contributing to solving the control problem. Whereas if you were just trying to develop AI, you would be one guy out of 100,000 and you really right. wouldn't make any noticeable difference. Is there even agreement among the half dozen or dozen so people who are working on this now as to the approach? I imagine there's some tension even about how we approach this. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that there, there is recognition that that this early stage, we need to explore several different approaches uh, because we don't yet know which one w will be most fruitful. So um, it, it would sort of be pre premature to, to narrow down the, the scope of investigation into one particular very specific idea about how to go about it. We, we are still kind of trying to figure out what the right concepts are to, to use in thinking about these things. Um, and, and of course, the whole thing is more difficult because we don't yet have the particular architecture where this would be applied. So you have to do more foundational work, things mm -hmm. that might be applicable to a wide range of different specific AI systems. 
It's a fascinating field. If you were a young person who were thinking, uh, was thinking or was listening and said, yeah, I'd like to make a big difference in the world. What, what, what should you study? Comp computer science, math, philosophy? Well, it depends on, on your talents and stuff like that. Right. So, I mean, there are other areas as well where you could contribute. For most people, the best way to contribute would just be to earn as much money as possible and then donate a fraction <laughs> of it to the relevant <laughs> organizations. Peter Thiel recommends, uh, using, uh, rec recommends using the, um, the, the principle of division of labor. Right, uh, right. Peter Thiel recommends your book in his book. So I think maybe go to Peter. Say, give us a little something, something. We're talking to uh, Nick Bostrom, the author of Superintelligence Paths, Dangers, Strategies. Let's talk a little more about the strategies, the plans, what we, what we have to do in just a bit. Our show today brought to you by Personal Capital. I want to tell you about this incredible free, secure tool that will solve two problems that everybody faces uh, when planning for your future. First of all, it's hard to keep track of what you got and what you owe, your bank accounts, your mortgage, your 401k, your stocks, they're all on different sites, different usernames and passwords. You, you can't see them all at once. And then the second problem is how do you decide what to invest in? Do you pay someone to manage it? Are you paying too much? Do you try to do it yourself? Are you making the right decisions? Personal Capital solves this. It puts all your assets and your accounts in one easy to understand single screen on your computer, on your phone, or on your tablet. With real-time intuitive graphs, you can even get updates on your Android Wear watch. I think that's really cool. It's an award-winning watch app that will uh, integrate with personal capital on your other Android device and uh, that provides you with relevant and timely updates on your finances wherever you go. Personal capital will tell you if you're overpaying in fees, how to reduce those fees. It will help you rebalance your investments, help you tailor, uh, tailor some advice to help you optimize for uh, your future. This is the kind of personal planning everybody needs to do and uh, even if you're young and you think oh i'm never going to retire believe me it happens faster than you think personalcapital.com slash triangulation even just planning to buy a house or put some money away for a rainy day it needs you need to do the right thing and personal capital can help you do it personalcapital.com slash triangulation and again it's free and easy and set it up today bill harris the founder was a guest on this show a couple of years ago and talked about it, and I signed up then, and I'm very happy I did. Personalcapital.com slash triangulation. A few more minutes with Nick Bostrom. He is the author of a book that just came out. Super, I cannot recommend it more highly. Uh, and I think you get a sense from our conversation um, how important this is. Superintelligence, paths, dangers, and strategies. So you say there's a do half dozen, a dozen people thinking about this, uh, kind of doing the foundational work because you can't, you, you, we don't even know what the superintelligence is going to look like, let alone when it's going to happen. But you've got to do some foundational work about how you would optimize. Is the goal to make this superintelligence a equal partner with humans? Probably not. It's not clear why we would want exactly an equal partner. I mean, I think we would want something that would... Um, Subordinate? Something that would be an, in, like sort of our interest or some kind of ethical purpose as opposed to some random thing like the example I gave earlier with the paperclip maximizer. So it's easier to say what we don't want, like something that just transforms everything into paperclips or that just uh, converts the universe into more and more computational structure to calculate the decimal expansion of pi to have a greater precision <laughs> or, or most other things like that. Um, but something instead that, that would capture... Um, what, what, like some kind of idealized version of human values. Do you feel like you're kind of a, an AI Paul Revere that uh, you and people like you, James Barrett, are, are, are shouting, the AI is coming, the AI is coming, you better, we better start thinking about this? Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily a role for which I'm very suited. So I'm, I can, by, by nature, more in, in, in inclined and suited to actually try to do the actual research rather, rather than raising uh, some kind of alarm or uh, uh, encouraging people to get involved. Um, However, but, and it's also not clear like whether you, how helpful it is to have some sort of general mobilization at this point. It's not clear what most people would actually do to help. Right. At this point, 
with AI, I don't see any clear way for, say, regulatory responses to be very helpful. No. There are other existential risks where that could help a lot, maybe with synthetic biology and other things like that. But with AI at this stage, it, it seems that the main thing we need is to get some technical work going and, and to develop stronger collaborations with practitioners who are developing these AI systems to make sure that that things will be implemented in time. And and the main way that, that other uh, uh, people can contribute is maybe by helping fund this and such. One um, thing that I think is interesting from the book is, um, and is kind of counter to what I would have thought, is that you you one of the things you're particularly concerned about is a singular AI. Well, I mean, I'm concerned both with the singleton outcome where there's one AI that shapes everything, but I'm also concerned with multipolar outcomes where instead you have this competitive ecology and economy of competing AIs. Um, I think that the issues are quite different in these two different classes of scenario, but they're serious in either case. So, so we could talk about either, uh, depending well, let, on what you want. Yeah, we, the, uh, <laughs> this is, uh, we'll call the singleton uh, uh, hypothesis the, uh, th this is a very common one in, um, you know, the Skynet hypothesis is a very common one in science fiction that there is an overarching AI that is uh, suddenly become sentient. Um, how, do you feel like that's a, a somewhat likely scenario? That's a scary scenario to me. I don't know why. Well, the uh, the question of whether the AI would be sentient or not, whether it have subjective conscious experiences, is one that I don't really talk very much about in the book because most of the questions uh, that I discuss don't really hinge on that. Right. Uh, whether there are internal phenomenal, phenomenal experiences or not, the AI, the Doesn't superintelligence, matter. would be very yeah. instrumentally capable of achieving outcomes in, in right. the world. So we need to be concerned about that. Yeah, nobody, nobody uh, wonders whether Watson uh, is thinking about itself. Uh, they just, it's the instrumentality that's in, of interest. The, yeah, well, the I mean, outside. in the case of Watson, it, I think there are additional issues that arise if, if machines have uh, phenomenal states. That is then, it becomes a matter of, moral concern what happens to the machines themselves and I mean for what it's worth I think that in principle you can instantiate uh, consciousness in, in machine substrate and that that could be one way in which in the long term if if mental states are valuable that a maximum number of these valuable mental states will be instantiated in machine substrate that could just be more efficient than biological substrate but Insofar as we are talking about the first superintelligence, I think the main concern there is getting it such that it will then be motivated to achieve these things that are valuable right. by, by human lights. Uh, not so much whether the first superintelligence during this period in human history, uh, a, a week or a year or whatever, when, when the future is settled, whether during that week or year there, there is subjective experience or not. So it doesn't matter the if the machine thinks it has an I, thinks I, but, uh, you know... I, I, I um, compute, therefore I am, much more important what its outcomes are in the, in the world. Can you, I mean, do you feel like we're going to make, are we making progress in, 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 in what, these, what we're going to teach this machine and what, how, how we're going to handle this, whether it's a singleton or a multipolar intelligence? Are we making progress here? Yeah, I think there's been uh, a lot of progress in the last few, few years, uh, but, but starting from a very, very low level, like... Uh, it's embarrassing for humanity, but for like two and a half decades, uh, these Asimov's laws of robotics, the science fiction writers, right, uh, were kind of state of the art. Um, <laughs> and, um, and and nevertheless, you you were able to blow it out of the water <laughs> in about three seconds. Yeah. So, so now there's this like looks like a really hard and momentous problem, yeah, and we've yeah. just started to chip away on it. So yes, mm -hmm. we know a lot more than a few years ago, but it's still like almost infinitesimal compared to what we need to figure out. Or so it looks like it might turn out that there is some surprising solution to this that, right. that somebody will stumble across and, and it, the whole problem could turn out to be easier to solve than, than we currently think. That, that's also possible. Uh, but the main, I mean, so one way in which we have progressed, as, as I said earlier, is that we have a deeper appreciation now of, of the nature of the problem that right. we are confronting. And the, the inadequacy, for instance, of a law to solve these problems. Yep. Really interesting stuff. Highly recommended. It is not easy. Uh, this is challenging stuff. Uh, and I think a lot of people would like Nick to say, well, this is what it's going to look like. And this is how we program it. But it's not that, it's much more complicated. And I think you'll get a better, very much better understanding of what the issues are if you read the book, Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers, and Strategies. 
It's out now, and uh, I highly, highly recommend it. So do many, many others in this field. Um, it is it is kind of the book to read right now. And I thank Nick uh, for taking some time. He's in England, so it's late at night. We'll let you go home to dinner. But I thank you for taking some time out of your day to join us to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the invitation. If you go to his website, there's a lot more there, Nick Bostrom. Right. Uh, dot com b o s t r o m nick thank you so much for joining us thank you i appreciate it uh we talk uh fascinating subjects like this every week on triangulation and i hope you will join us 11 a.m pacific 2 p.m eastern time 1900 utc on mondays if you could be here live i appreciate it if you can't don't worry we make on-demand audio and video of all of our shows uh 200 what it can't be right 150 shows something like that uh over the last uh, few years there's lots of food for thought there. 177 shows at twit.tv slash TRI or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash triangulation. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Triangulation. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.